such a difference to be able to uh, shower or a bath. Oh, yes. Chuck, can you turn? Hi, Sally. Hello, Ben. Hey. How's Mute Castle, Alan Angus? Is it? Uh... Great day here, not much sunshine yet. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our service this morning. My name is Chloe Spencer and I am one of the youth coordinators here at the West Church. Now today I'm in charge of all of the tech stuff as well. So please bear with me. Um, it's probably not going to be as slick as it normally is on a Sunday. Um, so if there's any glitches or awkward pauses or anything like that, just just roll with it because that would be great. I'm trying my best. Um, so this morning we're going to start off with some worship um, from the choir and Emily and Stuart. So I'm going to go ahead and try and do all of the sharing screens, etc. The chat is open. If anyone can't hear anything or there's some disaster, please just send me a message <laughs> so I can try and fix it. Um, but yeah, let's worship together. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory forever. <laughs> the disciples were very tired after their preaching tour. But the crowds around Jesus were as big as ever. There wasn't even time to stop for meals. When Jesus saw their exhausted faces, he said, we'll go off on our own for a rest. The disciples thankfully agreed and they all clambered into Peter's boat. And then they set off across the lake. Oh, I miss this boat. They go on the boat. So they're going across the lake. But as they drew nearer to the land, they saw that the quiet spot they had chosen was full of people all waiting for that first glimpse of Jesus. They had seen the boat leave and they had raced ahead of them to the shore, arriving ahead of Jesus. The disciples groaned with disappointment, but Jesus looked at the people with pity. They were in such need of his loving care. All day, he decided to teach them, but when the evening came, the disciples had had enough. <laughs> They said to Jesus, send the crowds away, master. There are no shops here and they'll have, they'll have to hurry if they need to get to town to buy food for their own dinners. And then Jesus asked, why don't you give them a meal? Look, the disciples are so exhausted, aren't they? But why don't you give them a meal? Philip said, however, could we do that? It would cost a small fortune to feed this number. There must be at least 5,000 men, not including women and children. Then Andrew spoke and said, there's a lad here who's offered Jesus his lunch, but it's only two little fish and five small bread loaves. So what good is that? Ready, can you put that on the table, Cooper? Jesus did not answer Andrew's question. He said to the disciples, sort the groups into 50, then get them to sit on the grass. As the disciples went off to sort everyone Mommy. out, Jesus turned to the boy who was waiting with the food. And um, thank you, he said with a smile, and he took his packed lunch from him. So we put the packed lunch in front of Jesus. Put the food in front of Jesus. Ready? Wow, so we've got some bread and fish here. When everyone was ready and waiting, Jesus held up the picnic food for all to see and thanked God for it. You say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. No one understood what happened next. They only knew that the bread and the fish, you hand all the bread and the fish to all of the crowd, feed it to them. They only knew that the bread and the fish that Jesus had handed to each disciple to give the crowd was more than enough for them all. Can you feed them all? Not yourself. Even the children had to say, I'm full at last. But how good it tasted. Each of the 12 disciples was left with a basket full of food that had not been needed. That will do for our next meal, Jesus said. How wonderful their master was, and he could satisfy their deepest needs as well as seeing 
that they all had enough food. It's the end. Can you say the end, Cooper? What I love about our church is Sunday mornings when we can meet in church mm -hmm. and just being in that building with people that I know and I am known and accepted and we're a community there gathered together to worship God and mm -hmm. and a highlight for me was the Easter service in 2014. Right. So Easter day and that if my memory serves me right, was the first Sunday back after the church renovations. So we'd been in the school and that Easter Sunday we were back in the church and the church was just amazing with all the renovations and mm. Easter day, mm. the best day in the Christian year, church was packed and it was just such a wonderful service full of joy and thanks. So that would be my highlight. Of course, when we joined, uh, we, we'd actually only seen one service in the old, um, uh, you know, church before 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 the renovations. Um, so we we got to know everybody in the school, um, and uh, that was that was really a lovely part of it because I don't know if if it kind of you know it freed everybody up to think a bit differently or do you know act or whether it always been like that. But it was something really kind of lovely about being coming into that community in, in that place and then getting to see see it um in in, in the renovated church so that was just that was lovely yeah i think i think there's kind of two things that really stand out for me as part of that sunday morning um the the music if 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 i if it don't sound like we're tooting our own trumpet but but is it usually somebody else's that we're, we're, i'm listening to and, and get carried away with and it doesn't matter if it's um you know something that's you know, a classic hymn that's on the organ, or if it's um, something modern that's coming from the band, it's the singing with such conviction that everyone's got. You know that that you know not everyone is into singing, uh, but but the, it feels like the whole congregation really swells up to sing these songs and and sing sing some meaning. And I really like that, and that that really feeds off my own kind of feelings as, as, as well at the same time. So, so music's a, a big big highlight, um, and and uh, and that's something I really love about our church that we really sing out and, and that, that that's amazing. Um, and the other thing which um, really really stands out for me is the um, is the way in which people in, in the older generations have shown such interest and such warmth in us as a family. Um, and and that's just really telling and 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 the, the, there's a lot of a lot of people who, who do that and that is just so important and, and, and so wonderful. So, so uh, yeah, those are two things I, I really love about our church. Thank you, Kathy and David, for doing that interview together. We're going to see a little bit more of that after. And um, we've got some lovely news to announce this week. A little baby, I'll just try and get him up on the screen. So this is Harrison Marshall Stone, and he is Laura and Dorian Stone's son, born on Saturday the 26th of June, weighing eight pounds exactly, and the second grandson of Mary and David Marshall. So welcome little Harrison, he's Gorgeous and congratulations to the Stones and the Marshalls too. I'm going to pray now and then we're going to continue with the service. So let's pray. Lord, we pray for the family spending time together this holiday, for building of relationships, rest and recuperation. For our young people transitioning into new years at school or moving on to the next chapter of their lives. Give them guidance and peace in their new environments. For those that are lonely this summer, Lord, bring companionship. Help us reach out to those who may be struggling. We pray for those who are experiencing big changes new parents, big moves, new relationships. Be with them in the highs and lows and fill them with your presence 
as they take each day at a time. Lord, drive us to be a community of love and support to one another here and in the wider world, following in the steps of your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, then question two. Um, tell me about a moment where you really experienced God or felt God's presence. What was that like and why was it meaningful? I kind of struggled with that question a bit because um, I guess I've kind of got quite an intellectual approach to, to my faith. So I don't feel God's presence in lots of kind of deep spiritual ways or anything like that. I know he's there. Um, and, and, and I can feel it in that in that sense, but but a kind of moment where 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 there's that kind of clarity that comes across. I'm quite envious of people for that kind of thing, but it, it's it's not something which I I tend to experience. I think obviously because I'm a musician, that tends to be the place I get most spiritual. Um, but and there's a there's a song which I've been listening to quite a lot. It's Jeremy Camp and uh, his song. Um, Keep me in the moment, and uh, that is a. I don't know if you know that one, Kathy, but it, it's oh. it, it, it's it's well worth listening to, um, because it, it has been really relevant in pandemic. He released it just a bit before the pandemic, um, and uh, but the, the words are really relevant, and it just reminds me that God's in everything that we do, um, in, in particular in the family life, and I think that's that's where I feel the kind of spirituality as, as well so it's being present in the moment and realizing mm. that you know god is everywhere and in everything we do yeah what about you yeah well, i've been a christian a long time over 40 years and mm. in that time i've uh, yeah experienced god talking to me through the bible through bible studies teaching at church and yeah but one memorable um, occasion uh, was a long time ago before there was a paid youth worker at the West Church and Ian and I used to help out running the youth, youth group it was called and it met on a Sunday and so this particular Sunday night it was invite a friend and we'd arranged games for the young people to play and during one of those games which was a wee bit rough one of the boys a friend who'd been invited broke his arm oh. And it was yeah, horrible for that child, he'd broken his arm, but actually for everybody it was a wee bit traumatic and and his parents were, were brilliant, you know, they, they just said, oh, accidents happen, it's fine, and they didn't blame the inner eye or the church or anything. And, but then we were due to take the youth group to Ardenaig, which is a, an outdoor centre on Loch Tay, and I was just getting myself into such a state about broken bones and people hurting themselves and it was our responsibility and and, and the run up to Ardenaig three times this verse came through bible readings or bible studies and it is Psalm 34 20 God protects all his bones not one of them will be broken so three times I had that verse <laughs> and that was pretty clear that God was going to protect us and but I got to Ardenaig and I was still worried. And that first night in the night, I had a very vivid dream of a figure in white saying to me, God is the God of the universe and everything's going to be all right. And I, more or less wow. telling me off not to worry kind of thing. Yeah. And I woke up after that dream and I, I just knew God <laughs> was reassuring me and just his care that I was worried, but really I shouldn't be worried. And the rest of the weekend went fine, of course, and nobody broke any bones. But that was one of the more memorable ones. I, you know, I don't often have dreams where I've got people in white talking to me. But, <laughs> um, but I agree that God in everyday life is that's that's where that's that's important, and just living living in reference to Him and yeah, having Him there is is really really important.
you might think that when we get together like this, the people who take part in the service are just saying whatever comes into their head or they're being inspired in the moment. It may not always be obvious, but in actual fact, most, nearly all of what happens when we get together, either here online or in person, is it's done with a lot of purpose, with a lot of thought. It doesn't happen by accident, whether that's the choice of the music, the work done with and through the children, or even down to the list of prayer suggestions in our bulletin. It's done with purpose. When I introduce myself, I tend to say that I get to be the minister at the West Church. And again, that's not by accident. I mean it. I'm not made to say it. I choose to say it. And I, I say it because what I do, I don't do grudgingly. I do it because I think it's what I was supposed to do. It's what I was made for. It's something I privileged and privileged to do. If we're talking about phrases that people use a lot, I tend to refer to this book as the collection of books we call the Bible. And that's because on purpose, I want to remind us that this is not a book, but this is a library of books, a bookshelf full of books, a library of writings that tell hundreds of stories, but at the same time, one God story. And at the centre of that story is the stories, the life, the death and the resurrection of a young Jewish teacher in the first century, 2000 odd years ago in Palestine. And this young Jewish rabbi or teacher stir things up in his own Jewish story and in the middle of the Greek and the Roman culture by the kind of things he says and what he does. And we've been following that in a book called Luke and we're going to take a break for a few weeks and just look at some particular core values that come out of this collection. At the time Jesus is living, the Jewish situation was one of poverty and oppression. The Roman Empire had them under their boot. There were a few of them who didn't mind because they were kept rich and kept comfortable in their situation. But for most people, that was not what they had been promised. They believed they were meant to be blessed and that their God was somebody who rescued and somebody who'd made them and had chosen them. And they hoped that things would get back to the way they preferred waiting to get back to how things were. Does that sound a familiar hope? In this collection, during some of the worst times in their people's history and stories, God would speak, speak through people inspired called prophets. And in these writings that had been collected, there were vague ideas about a person, somebody who would come and help sort things out, a, a priest, a prophet, a king, a, a messiah. And the common assumption was that this messiah would be a warrior king, would come and raise up a new empire, smash the Romans who were the current problem, and then have a real kingdom of Israel, maybe a new empire. Bit by bit in his life, Jesus of Nazareth takes these expectations apart, revealing that that's too limited for this God, that their assumptions about their scriptures and about their own position were too small, that God was doing more that he was facing and defeating all sorts of enemies, not just the Romans. Something called sin, the addictions they had to mucking things up and all the barriers that got between them and each other and them and their God and them and their creation, the creation around them. Jewish teachers had, at the time, a love of getting around and discussing their commands. They called them their Torah. And some might joke that that is a a human way of trying to not deal with what's actually in them, to just talk about them and around them. So there were all sorts of common discussions. One was about which of all the different commands, and there are about 613 in their Jewish writings, which was the most light, which meant it didn't apply so much, and the heavy, the ones that were more important. So which, which ones were more important than others? Another common thing to discuss was um, how you could sum them all up. Could you sum them all up instead of having to work and remember them all? So standing right in the centre of their Jewish culture and their faith in the temple, Jewish teachers are actually attacking Jesus, trying to make him make mistakes. And they ask him, what is the greatest of the commandments? Because they think if he, if he goes one way, then they can 
attack him from the other side because a different group of people will feel things or if he goes the other way they can then attack what he's missed out on the other side so he can't really win in this question it's designed to trip him up well he then responds by choosing in actual fact he cheats a little bit two commands love god and love those around you love your neighbor as you love yourself now we might have heard this a few times and might think this is a really simple answer but the real brilliance of his answer is that in these two short phrases he has summed up everything but also he's done something deeply traditional that they can't argue with because the heart of their Torah is something called the Shema a prayer that's said twice a day by every Jew and it's about loving your God and then also from the heart of their Torah in Leviticus where it says to love your neighbor as you love yourself Jesus is saying nothing that's new so he can't be argued with but at the same time by putting love at the center he's challenging everything that was happening at the time he's saying the most important thing is not to obey all these commands but to love to love the God who loves us, to love the people around us. And the motivation for that is not to behave in a certain way, to get a prize, to obey a set of rules, to prove how Jewish you are. The motivation is to love and to be loved, to love because we are loved. And then we will want to live out this way. That's the reason for all these commands, to help us live out who we were made to be. Jesus says, love is the only command and love is the only test and none of the teachers can argue with them so it's not about behaving it's not about storing up credit it's not about duty it's not about winning it's not about me 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 at the expense of everyone around my brothers and sisters love is the only command and love is the only test love Jesus reveals is the key to understanding all these writings and the reason that we might want to obey these commands all the commandments the Torah the law are not a duty to be obeyed but an invitation into the life that we were made for Jesus says the whole law and the prophets hang on these two the whole law and the prophets hang on these two I hang on these two we are invited we are made to respond to challenges like this
I'm just going to end with that same blessing for everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Um, if you'd like to stick around, I'm going to set up some breakout rooms so you can go and chat to some folk after the service. If you're not going to be around, have a wonderful day. Um, and hopefully, as restrictions ease, we're going to be bumping into each other more and more. So um, have a lovely week. <laughs>